Welcome to the Max Future Weekly Podcast. All Apple talk and no chit chat. Hey, welcome to the Apple Podcast by Lex at MaxFuture.com. And today is August 26, 2011. And this episode of the Apple Podcast will be completely devoted to Steve Jobs and the recent announcement on August 24th, Wednesday, August 24th, that he is resigning as CEO of Apple, but retaining his position as chairman of Apple's board of directors and remaining as an employee. And I'm going to be talking about about what this means and also highlighting some of the better um, better blog posts that are out there. So this is going to be a chit-chat free all Apple talk about Steve Jobs, one of the greatest tech innovators and uh, CEOs in the country's, if not the world's history. So let's get to it. Okay, so look, the bombshell that came down this week, following two bombshells that came down the week before, is that uh, late Eastern time on Wednesday, August 24th, news spread that Steve Jobs um, sent a letter to the board of directors of Apple's essentially resigning his position as Apple's chief executive officer but asking if he could still continue to serve as chairman of the board of Apple and a director of Apple and as an Apple employee. And it was a bombshell. I was on vacation with my family. I got a call from a friend on a cell phone around dinner time saying, you know, Steve Jobs has just resigned. And I was kind of in shock. It was all over Twitter. A lot of people were shocked. On the other hand, you know, my initial feeling wasn't shock, but hey, I had a feeling this was eventually coming because Steve Jobs has been battling cancer for a number of years. He's had a rare form of pancreatic cancer. He had liver transplant. He's had all sorts of care. And, um, you know, so it wasn't completely unexpected, except you don't just expect it out of the blue like that. On the other hand, he is retaining his position as chairman. So this is what Steve Jobs wrote in the letter that Apple made public. To the Apple Board of Directors and the Apple community, I have always said if there ever came a day when I could no longer meet my duties and expectations as Apple's CEO, I would be the first to let you know. Unfortunately, that day has come. I hereby resign as CEO of Apple. I would like to serve, if the board sees fit, as chairman of the board, director, and Apple employee. As far as my successor goes, I strongly recommend that we execute our succession plan and name Tim Cook as CEO of Apple. I believe Apple's brightest and most end of days are ahead of it, and I look forward to watching and contributing to its success in a new role. I have made some of the best friends of my life at Apple, and I thank you all for the many years of being able to work alongside you, Steve. So that was it. Quite an, elo- uh, quite an eloquent letter, effective, and meaningful. So there's a couple of interesting things in the letter. Um, He he already was the chairman of the board of Apple, and he just wants to continue in that role. Now, it's normal for a CEO to also be the chairman of a board of a corporation. That's very common. It's also common for occasionally a CEO to resign as CEO but seek to maintain the position as chairman of the board of directors. Some of you not familiar with corporate governance uh, might not understand what all this means. Let me just spell it out for you simply. Apple, like many corporations, is a public company. And as a public company, it has a board of directors. The board of directors represent the shareholders and the stockholders of the company. The shareholders and stockholders of the company own the company. Uh, 
So there are millions and millions of shareholders of Apple Inc. And they own the shares of Apple and they collectively own Apple. And they elect the board of directors and you know there's uh, I don't know maybe half a dozen or so or more be maybe more board of directors for Apple and they represent the ownership and normally though a lot of these board of directors are nominated by management now management are the people who actually run the company day to day the board of directors approves the decision making so Steve Jobs had a role as chairman of the board of directors and also being chief executive officer uh, chief executive officer is like the president of the company the guy who runs it every day so Steve Jobs isn't completely giving up a role at Apple he's giving up the role as the day-to-day -day chief who runs the day-to-day -day operations of Apple and makes the decisions now because he's going to retain a position of chairman he's still going to be very powerful because the chairman together with other board members can fire the CEO and thus he has some power like I said many CEOs are also the chairman of their board so the person who's going to be replacing Steve Jobs and uh, Apple quickly um, quickly confirmed that Tim Cook the current chief operating officer is going to be the CEO of Apple that person at Apple may not have as much power as a CEO at a company where the CEO is also the chairman of the company the other thing that's interesting about Steve Jobs letter is that he says he plans to continue as an employee of Apple now a lot of board of directors of companies they don't they're not really well I don't know they're not really employees of of companies they're they get a salary as a member of the board of directors but they're not really employees but Steve Jobs has signaled that he wants to re re continue to be not only a chairman and a director but also an Apple employee so it sounds like he still wants to contribute to Apple's day-to-day -day operations in some capacity but not as the CEO and he's still gonna guide Apple strategically as the chairman um, while also Tim Cook is the CEO and we've seen this in some other companies particularly companies that are sometimes founded by someone and then that person doesn't want to operate the company day-to-day -day and then becomes the manager um, becomes the chairman of the board all right, so that's what that means. We'll talk more about that. Um, but I'll tell you, like, it was a pretty shocking um, announcement by Steve Jobs, and a lot of people who've been following Apple had all sorts of reactions to it. So let's discuss some of that. So that night, while on vacation, I, um, I wrote a post, which I think really captured how I felt at that moment about Steve Jobs, and I entitled it, Steve Jobs, what he means to this Apple com customer, Apple stockholder, and Apple blogger. And this is what I said. I said, Steve Jobs just announced that he is resigning as CEO of Apple, but retaining the position as chairman of the board. This is a sad day. It is the end of an era. It is unlikely that Steve Jobs will ever resume the day-to-day -day management of Apple as its CEO. Steve Jobs has been sick for several years with a rare form of cancer. I don't know when he will die, just like I don't know when anyone will die. So this isn't a eulogy. Instead, it is my reflections on Steve Jobs and Apple and how much they have meant for me and for countless others. Steve Jobs and Apple are the greatest comeback story and the greatest revenge of the nerds story. Apple was the laughing stock of the technology industry in the mid 1990s when Apple bought brought next and brought back as CEO Steve Jobs Apple's original co-founder in his second run with Apple Steve Jobs took Apple from being a puny small revenue has been technology company to becoming the powerhouse of America's technology industry
Incredibly, Steve Jobs, as CEO, grew Apple's revenues and profits to become the most valuable public company in the world. Just a few weeks ago, Apple surpassed Exxon for that spot. How incredible. How amazing. For a Macintosh guy, an Apple guy like me, what Steve Jobs accomplished in his first and second runs as CEO with Apple are just astounding. In 1986, I purchased my first Macintosh. Since then, I have always had at least one Macintosh computer in my home. In stark contrast to what I have had at home, my work computer has always been a PC. I never wanted a PC at work. It has been forced upon me by whatever enterprise IT decision masters I have been subjugated by. Since 1986, I haven't been able to understand how other people, particularly enterprise IT, dec IT decision makers, can use PCs instead of Macintoshes. For years, I, like others, felt like outsiders. We were part of a small band of sane technology users who understood why the Macintosh and Apple were better than PCs. And our heroes were the two Steves, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, who invented Apple and gave us the Macintosh. The Macintosh in particular was more Steve Jobs' baby than Wozniak's child. When there, when there were Macworld conventions that Apple appeared in, I attended. I went to the shows in Boston and New York City, the latter at the Javits Center. They were always so incredibly exciting. Not only were the new Macintoshes displayed, but I got to see the countless cool software and Macintosh-related gadgets that were made by third-party companies. It was a cult of Mac. So imagine how blown away all of us cultists became when our hippie chief, Steve Jobs turned out to be the greatest CEO in Fortune 500 history. Steve Jobs has taken Apple to the stratosphere of corporate earnings. He has vanquished his competitors. Dell, whose CEO Michael Dell taunted Apple in the 1990s, is now a joke of a PC vendor. Dell, as a company, is now worth, is worth a small fraction of Apple's total value. Similarly, HP, where Wozniak worked when he invented the Apple computer, in which turned down the Apple computer just announced it's getting out of the PC industry and is quickly abandoning tablet plans, all because of the, quote, tablet effect, end quote, which has to be translated as meaning the, quote, iPad, end quote, is killing the PC business and vanquishing any tablet competition. And Microsoft, Apple's historic enemy, has had a stagnant stock price since, the, for, since for 11 years and a shrinking PC market share. So it is sad that Steve Jobs has to resign from the CEO position, but I am very happy that Steve Jobs will remain chairman of the board. That means he is somewhat healthy. He is alive, and that is what counts. I have Apple stock. It could go up. It could go down. But in the end, what I care about is that I believed in Apple and Steve, and they proved us tech cultists right, taking Apple to the greatest height. I am sure that Apple stock will go down tomorrow. The common wisdom is that Apple's success is attributed to Steve Jobs. But Apple watchers like me know that Steve Jobs has groomed corporate lieutenants who are loyal to both him and his vision for running a highly innovative and financially successful company. I plan to hold on to my stock. With the events of last week, Google announcing its proposed purchase of Motorola and HD dumping the PC and the touchpad, Steve Jobs' announcement today is somewhat poetic. He goes out on top as CEO. Google's purchase of Motorola is viewed as an acknowledgement that Android is floundering in the face of the iOS devices. HP's announcements, as discussed above, is a surrender to Apple's success in personal computing with the Macintosh and the iPad. Apple stock surpassed Exxon and broke $400 per share this summer. So much has been accomplished. The only other great milestone is for Apple to hit $1,000 per share and capture the enterprise market. So thanks, Steve Jobs. And as a Macintosh user and Apple customer since 1986, as a stockholder and as an Apple blogger, I say thank you. And I know I speak for many. So that was my post. Okay, so the immediate impact of uh, Steve Jobs' resignation letter in the aftermarket of trading of Apple stock on August 24th was that the stock was down, and this is, remember, in the aftermarket, not the regular trading time. It was down 5%. 
So, you know, it took a little bit of a blow in the aftermarket because people were like, oh, God, you know, Steve Jobs is no longer with with Apple. But um, Apple stock the next day, the 25th, which is Thursday, rebounded and was trading back in the, you know, $372 range or so. So, you know, basically the market did not tank as much as people thought it would when Steve Jobs basically said he was no longer CEO. And even checking this afternoon, Friday, August 26th, Apple stock is doing really well. The whole market's up and it's at $383.80 as I record this at about 4.09 p.m. And you know this is right after the market closed. So let's look at the five-day timeline here. If we go to Yahoo Finance, we can go to a chart here. And the chart's loading. So if you look here, there's a little bit of a, you know, it started on Thursday down, you know, below 370 and then climbed back up. So there's a little bit of a bump here, and that's the Steve Jobs news. But look, Apple stock is recovering very well because a lot of people have been preparing for Steve to go. And Steve has been preparing to go, and he hasn't been around. He's been sick, and Tim Cook has been really running things as the chief operating officer. And also the news here isn't that Steve Jobs is going for good. He's still going to be chairman, and he's still going to be an employee. Now, it'll be interesting, God forbid, God forbid Steve Jobs should die, and all of us are going to die at some point, what would happen then? And so, in a way, I think this is very clever. It's sort of a transition period. Steve Jobs is helping with the transition. Now, what's interesting in his resignation letter, he said, you know, I am resigning and I'm recommending Tim Cook pursuant to our succession plan. So that means Apple had a succession plan. Apple had been criticized by outside stock analysts and others because Apple didn't officially release what's its succession plan. So Steve Jobs maybe in a jab at his critics is basically saying, no, there was a succession plan. And pursuant to that, I'm recommending Tim Cook, who is the current who was the current chief operating officer and now is the CEO. Now, the timing of Steve Jobs' announcement, some people point out that Apple had a regularly scheduled board of directors meeting on August 24th. And Steve Jobs was in for the day working. And so maybe he timed it because, you know, board of directors meetings are not every day. They're, you know, usually sp spaced out over maybe a month or two or on a quarterly basis. And so for any big change in CEOs, you need the board of directors approval. And so maybe he timed it for his board of directors um, meeting. And so he figured, I'll get, you know, I'll resign and then they quickly approved Tim Cook as the CEO and Bill and, and um, Steve Jobs to continue as the chairman and an employee. So maybe it was, you know, all planned out this way. And, you know, he said in his letter that, um, that you know, if there ever came a time where he felt he couldn't serve anymore as CEO, he would let the board know. And he is judging for himself. He thinks it's not best for him to continue as CEO. So some people read this as, oh, he's physically getting worse. And he, other people have pointed out that, no, he's not getting worse. He's been in this state. And so maybe he just figured this was the time. This is the time. Apple's on top. Apple's doing well. As I point out in my post, Apple's competitors are, are highly on the defensive. HP is completely retreating from the PC business as well as the tablet business. Uh, Google acknowledges that there are issues with Android, and so it's buying Motorola. Uh, and Apple's just, you know, poised to have great things happen in the coming quarter. So the timing could be that this is just a great time to make this transition. It would be least disruptive for Apple stock. It would be least disruptive in terms of Apple's plans to announce things. And so maybe that's why he announced it now. Uh, and we'll never know because we're not in Steve's mind and we're not, you know, in this inner circle. But that could be the reason. So I thought I'd discuss some of the better blog posts regarding Steve Jobs' uh, resignation on the Internet. One of the better ones was by Giga Ohm's uh, founder, um, 
uh, Om Malik, who had a nice post on August 24th called Steve Jobs and the Sound of Silence. And basically, you know, he gives this very moving blog post. He starts off by saying, like many of my colleagues in Silicon Valley, I was having a fantastic day today. It is crisp in the shade, warm in the sun. The skies are a magical blue with puffy clouds floating like dreams. And when, and when all seemed to be going well, an email in my inbox without as much as the new message sound arrived, letter from Steve Jobs, it was as if the inbox was observing the solemn, some solemnity of the occasion. It is the end of an era. So some of the points that he makes that I find very poignant are, you know, what what Steve meant. And he says here, at, towards the end of his post, as the founder of a company, Steve's biggest gift to me is not the MacBook or the iPhone. Instead, it's the confidence to disrupt myself. Whitney Johnson, a founding partner at Rose Park Advisors, recently wrote, we typically define disruption as low-end product or service that eventually upends an industry, but I found that the rules of disruption apply to the individual too, or as thought leader Jennifer Serlet writes, innovation ultimately begins on the inside, end quote. So Om Malik says that, quote, Jobs is a perfect example of that. He could have settled for status quo and gone on as the chief executive, but, but why wait? After all, he is the man who can see the future better than most of us. And it, even if it means a full stop to what has been an incredible career. Thanks, Steve. So what he's basically saying is that Steve is, is the great disruptor. And his, his last disruptive act was to sort of take this out of occasion moment to just out of the blue say he's no longer going to be the CEO and instead is going to be just the chairman of the board and an employee. So... You know, check out Ohm's entire post on August 24th. I have a link to it. It's very poignant. Okay, another very eloquent post comes from the esteemed M.G. Siegler at TechCrunch. He's one of my favorite writers in technology, including Mac technology. And he had a great post on, um, was it the 25th or the 24th, called One More Thing, dot, dot, dot. You know, and Steve Jobs is famous for doing these keynote presentations where he ends it with, okay, one more thing, and then, so, and then announces something truly amazing. So in Siegel's post, he basically goes on about you know Steve Jobs and his history and all that, but then he makes a very interesting observation. In his letter, resignation letter, Steve Jobs, talks about that he he believes you know Apple's brightest and most innov days, innovative days are ahead and Siegler believes that that Steve Jobs the constant showman in promoting Apple and Apple products maybe has one more thing up his sleeve and yes he's you know no longer CEO but he is still chief executive officer and he is an Apple employee and so he thinks that that means something in the letter when he says Apple's the most in the in the innovative days are coming. And so he says in his blog post at some point, he says this, the truth is that from a pure logistical standpoint, Jobs doesn't need to come back to the SEC role. Perhaps his letter is a simple acknowledgement of that. Or perhaps it's part of a broader plan. This is Siegler talking. He says, we're approaching the fall. All indications are that it's going to be a massive one for Apple. Maybe Jobs wants to make this move a formality, given the past several months, really, and the relative calm before the storm. The market rewarded this decision. For years, all we've heard about is about how, when Steve Jobs was no longer head of Apple, the stock would be destroyed. The actual result, question mark, a 0.65% loss for the day. The broader NASDAQ index actually did much worse, a 1.95% loss. This is on the 25th. Had the market risen today, Apple probably would have closed up. So then he goes on to say, um, with the appointment of Cook out of the way, perhaps now it's on to phase two of Jobs' last plan, that killer fall. And he goes on to say, We've been hearing since early this year that Apple was planning something special this fall. 
Until recently, that seemed to be another new iPad. However, the latest talk indicates that compo component shortages may have pushed that product to early next year. And the truth is that Apple really may not need it. So um, he goes on to say, we know that iOS 5 is coming and very likely alongside the iPhone 5. There will also likely be a cheaper iPhone 4S. Um, and he goes on to say, and there is talk of the company having some tricks up its sleeve when it comes to the new content for iTunes. And then he says, there's also whispers of Apple completely redoing iTunes itself, not just the 64-bit rewrite we got with iTunes 10, but a total reworking. So he basically sees um, that maybe that Steve Jobs is going to do something that com will completely blow people's mind away in the fall as his last act. In other words, he'll still be associated with Apple. He, Siegler, who's connected to sources, says, talking to sources in recent months, there's been one common refrain that the things Apple is working on right now are the best thing the company has ever done. These are things that will, quote, blow your mind, end quote, I've been told. That's what Siegler says. And then he goes on to say, what type of things? That I don't know, he says. There are a lot of talk, there's a lot of talk about the entire Mac brand itself being completely reimagined. We'll see. What about Apple Television? We'll see. So basically, he, he thinks that what's coming is Jobs' final, quote, one more thing, as it were. It may not be him on stage to present these things, he, uh, Siegler says, but I have faith that the products won't be any less great. We'll just have to see for ourselves instead of instinctively trusting Jobs' sales pitch. So that's very interesting, and I think a very interesting insight. I mean, Steve Jobs' trademark really is saying, and just one more thing. And so maybe by still being chairman, and what intrigues me is that he's also listed himself as an employee of Apple, not just a board director or chairman. So maybe he will have some role to play in the big fall announcement. Maybe, you know, I'm predicting it right now. Imagine how, how chilling and how emotional it's going to be if Tim Cook runs the fall presentation and, you know, has the lieutenants like uh, Ive and everybody. And then for the one more thing of the big announcement brings out Steve Jobs and Steve Jobs makes, you know, whatever crazy announcement it is, an Apple TV or a um, redesigned Macintoshes or something just incredibly mind-blowing. Maybe that will be the most phenomenal way for Steve Jobs to go out. Um, so, anyways, I, I found M.G. Siegler's post to be very intriguing. I've only given you a glimpse at it. And uh, check it out. It's on TechCrunch. I have a link to it on my blog post. And again, it's called One More Thing dot 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 from M.G. Siegler. Very cool. Okay, so the, another highly important post regarding Steve Jobs' resignation, of course, comes from John Gruber of Daring Fireball, one of the consummate Apple watchers. And this came out on Wednesday the 24th at, on 2011. And um, he makes a very important observation. I'll cut to the chase. He says, in one simple line, Jobs' greatest creation isn't any Apple product. It is Apple itself. And he's so right about that because... He's turned Apple into a consummate, um, you know, consummate manufacturer of beautiful, polished devices that at customers really love and are willing to pay a little bit of a premium. And I was thinking about Gruber's post because, you know, there's all these things that we take for granted that Apple produces. For example, the touchpad, which came out last summer. People don't write about it every day. It's this beautiful square slab that I use with my iMac, and I love it. I, I actually use my iMac, uh, my Magic Mouse, I'm sorry, my Magic Touchpad much more than any mouse now with my desktop computer. And it's beautiful. It's just, it's beautifully crafted. It's just this big, beautiful slab of aluminum. All of them, all of the aluminum is all the metal that Apple uses in its products, whether it's 
the iMac or the MacBook Air or the Magic Mouse or the, I'm sorry, the Magic Track trackpad, they're this beautiful polished metal that looks just fantastic and feels very solid. But other beautiful things, I mean, remember about a year ago, Apple came out with its own little little rechargeable batteries, very simply designed. I have this very elegant two battery nickel, whatever, iodine battery double A charger and the batteries are very just sort of simple and it's beautiful and I have I have several of these things and I use them to charge up batteries and they're white they're very classically elegantly designed and they're rather inexpensive I think I paid like 25 or 29 bucks and all of this all of this excellence comes from Apple and so what we have here is a company that believes in taste and value and you know whatever is coming out of Apple is going to be well made and just feel better it's going to be the total experience is going to be better. And, um, I mean, G Gruber just hits it perfectly on the mark. You know, and his, his article really is about, you know, can Apple succeed without Steve Jobs? And I think what he's saying, Gruber, is that Steve Jobs has created a company which is built on his aesthetic beliefs and what he truly believes in. And he believes in high quality, aesthetically pleasing products. Uh, and he believes in being profitable and making money. And he knows that, you know, the two can go together. You don't have to make cheap, you know, ugly products to make money. You can, you can make significant amounts of money, make a beautiful product, and have a lot of people buy it. And that's what Apple has perfected, particularly in the last 10 years uh, under Steve Jobs. And the people around him have been with him since he joined Apple. Um, Tim Cook came with him from Next, uh, or, or, or I'm sorry, he didn't come with him from Next. He, he joined Apple shortly after Steve Jobs uh, came back to Apple from Next. So, this is another post that you should um, read. Um, you know, Gruber's point is that you can't replace Steve Jobs, an irreplaceable person. But he, you know, he basically um, points out that Apple can continue to produce great products. Uh, here's a key paragraph. He says, Apple's products are replete with Apple-like features and details embedded in Apple-like apps running on Apple-like devices, which come packaged in Apple-like boxes, are promoted by Apple-like ads, and sold in Apple-like stores. The company is a fractal design, simplicity, elegance, beauty, cleverness, humility, directness, truth. Zoom out enough and you can see the same things that define Apple's products apply to Apple as a whole. The company itself is Apple-like. The same thought, care, and painstaking attention to detail that Steve Jobs brought to questions like, how should a computer work? How should a phone work? How should we buy music and apps in a digital age? He also brought to the most important question, how should a company that creates such things function? So he, he really captures it, uh, Gruber. His point is really well taken. The people who think that Apple will not succeed without Steve Jobs fail to realize that Apple is essentially an extension of Steve Jobs. Uh, he's created a company arguably with his DNA and it's been running like that from under Steve Jobs for most of its entire life since the you know the when it was created in 1977. So I think at least for five years, maybe longer, Apple is going to continue on that path. And so, I don't know, as a shareholder of Apple, I'm going to hold on to the stock. Okay, so the other thing I want to mention in, um, you know, discussing Steve Jobs' resignation is really <clears throat> discussing his thought process and some of the most important things he said. And there's a fantastic video on YouTube, and I have a link to it. There's over four million hits. And it's a video of Steve Jobs' commencement speech to Stanford on June 12, 2005. 
And if you go to Stanford's website, there's a, I have a link on my blog, you get the entire text. And in this speech, he makes some really good points that really capture the essence of who Steve Jobs is. Okay, so in his speech, which is very eloquent, he basically says, he says, today I want to tell you three stories from my life. That's it, no big deal, just three stories. The thing about Steve Jobs, that line is so beautifully said because you know, he's famous for like responding to people in email and he's always just cuts to the chase and with a humbleness with you. He doesn't come across as stuffy or, you know, some sort of arrogant stuff shirt. And and even his emails responses are just straight and to the point, you know, he uses the word nope in some emails. And here in this commencement speech to Stanford students in two thousand and five Look at this line. He says, today I want to tell you three stories from my life. That's it. No big deal. Just three stories. In other words, three stories from his life, he's saying, is no big deal. But he wants to tell you because in the scheme of things, it's no big deal. But in reality, it's illuminating. So what are the three stories he tells? The first story, he says, is about connecting the dots. And in this short first three segment, he talks about his background, how he was... Uh, adopted, how he, um, his biological mother gave him up and wanted him to be adopted by college-educated um, uh, parents, uh, and at the last second, uh, the people who were going to adopt him decided to go for a girl, and instead he was adopted, or the people seeking to adopt him weren't college-educated, but um, his mother basically got them to promise that they would someday uh, let Steve or you know pay for Steve to go to college and so Steve goes on to say that at some point he did go to college he went to Reed College and then discovered how expensive it was in terms of wiping out his parents entire life savings so he decided to just drop out and trust that it would all work out and he basically says that he followed a different path he he didn't. He was technically out of college, but ended up going more to college by just, you know, f sleeping on a friend's room's floor, floor, and um, returned Coke bottles for five cent deposits to buy food with. And he walked seven miles across town every Sunday to get one good meal a week at a Hare Krishna t temple. And he just basically would go to classes and learn whatever he wants. And then he points out that at Reed College at the time, I guess in the 70s, calligraphy was like a big deal and people were making all sorts of calligraphy posters and he ended up learning calligraphy and he learned the importance about serif and sans serif typeface and essentially he learned about design and about beauty and artistic subtlety and his point is that when he did that he didn't think it would have any practical application but that later on when he was designing the Mac, the Macintosh, it was um, the first computer that had beautiful typography. He brought the beauty that he learned from calligraphy class to the Mac. And if you look at all of Apple's products, the beauty and design, the aesthetic beauty, he's saying is coming from that. And he says... Uh, he ends that section by saying, and you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. You have to trust in something, your gut, destiny, life, karma, whatever. Um, and so basically he's saying, look, he doesn't, he trusts that things will work out. You know, he, he believes in karma. He believes in, you know, somehow the future will work out. And you have to go with your gut, which is very interesting. You know, here is a guy working in technology. He's working with engineers. Engineers are not romantic people, but Steve Jobs is a romantic people. He's saying, don't just be mathematical. Just don't be just a pure engineer. Think with your gut. Think of like, and also think of beauty. Look, the one criticism of Google, Google only hires engineers. Google probably wouldn't have hired Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs wasn't an engineer. He had, you know, he dropped out of college. Google doesn't hire people who drop out of college. Google hires 
people who have fantastic degrees from some of the best universities and it's a culture of engineers. Google's problem is it lacks the humanity, the beauty, the design that Apple has. And if you look at what Steve Jobs said in that speech, he, he went out and he, he found beauty, he found design. So his goal is not to just make computers. He's, his goal is to make computers that connect and work with people because people aren't machines. People want, people want something that has humanity in it. And if you look at Apple's designs, they appeal to the human in us. A robot wouldn't care. A robot wouldn't care what a computer looked like. A robot would not care what an, what an iPod looked at. The polishing, the shine, the curves of a MacBook Air, of the first iPod, of any of Apple products are essentially an effort to make computing appealing and beautiful to humans so that they'll be more comfortable using it. And that's what Steve Jobs really learned when he dropped out of class, when he went to the calligraphy class. So that's his first story from his speech. Okay, so the second story he says, he entitles, My Second Story is About Love and Loss. And basically he points out how you know lucky he was and he loved his early work with Woz creating, at Steve Wozniak creating Apple in his parents' garage when he was 20. And, you know, in 10 years, it grew from just the two of them to a $2 billion company. And then, boom, he gets fired. And he had just turned 30. So he got fired when he got, he turned 30. This was in, uh, in um, I guess, the mid-1980s. Um, I guess 85, because he was born in 1955. Um, so he basically you know, got fired by the, the the head of the guy he brought in from Pepsi. And it was very, I guess, humiliating for him. And he said he didn't know what to do. And he felt, um, he felt that he had let down the previous generation of entrepreneurs. And um, he, he met actually with David Packard and Bob Noyce and tried to apologize for screwing up so badly. Um, but the point is that uh, it turned out that getting fired from Apple, he says, was the best thing that could have happened to him. And he said the heaviness of being successful was replaced by the lightness of being a beginner again, less sure about everything. It freed him to enter one of the most creative periods of his life. And then he points out that he then started a company called Next, and he acquired another company named Pixar, and he fell in love with the woman who would become his wife. Pixar went on to create Toy Story, and 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 eventually Apple bought Next, and um, the whole renaissance that he's had with Apple came after that huge loss. So his point is that sometimes losing something or failing is a good thing. Um, you know, so he says sometimes life hits you in the head with a brick. He says don't lose faith. I'm convinced that the only thing that kept me going was that I loved what I did. You've got to find what you love, and that is as true for your work as it is for your lovers. Your work is going to fill a large part of your life, and the only way to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great work. And the only way to do great work is to love what you do. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking. Don't settle. So his point is, to these graduates, is... Find something that you love to do, and it'll work out. Because if you stick to something that you really love and are passionate about, you'll find your niche in life. And I think that's very real. And I think the other point he makes is, you know, a setback can be a good thing. Um, and that's something, again, like the Google people haven't really had. They've had this wild success as a search engine. And really, one of the reasons Apple has been so successful since Steve Jobs came back is because he matured. Um, getting fired from Apple and Apple almost going bankrupt in 1997 was a very cathartic thing for both Steve Jobs and Apple. You know, and what a lot of people who criticize Apple don't realize, you know, a lot of people get upset with Apple. They're like, oh, it's a closed system. 
Um, it doesn't have the openness of Line, Linux or Google Android. But wait a second, you know, Linux doesn't make any money. Um, Android's given away free by Google. Google subsidizes Android with its profits from search. Apple is in the business of making money. And that I don't think that's a bad thing for us consumers because if we're buying products from a company whose business plan is ultimately not going to work, then that company is going to go out of business and you're not going to be buying products from that company anymore. So your whole little ecosystem of being invested in a product is going to disappear and you're going to have to, you know, switch. Like, what about enterprise, you know, that's been buying from Hewitt Packard PCs? What about an enterprise just bought, you know, a whole bunch of PCs from Hewitt Packard six months ago? Well, now Hewitt Packard is saying they're going to get out of the business because they can't make money. Well, that's not good for the customers. You know, you want to invest. If you're going to buy products from a company and you're investing, you know, committing to a technology, you want to make sure that that company is financially, you know, working and so Steve Jobs you know gets fired because pr the profits weren't going well for Apple in the late 80s and Apple almost goes out of business brings Steve ba Jobs back and you know he he's so focused then he's focused on making products that are attractive attractively priced and will result in profits for Apple and the first of that was the iPod and then he learned from the iPod, you know, how to grow out a market, how to capture a market, how to make a product that people want that's superior to other products. And he's grown that out with the iPhone and now the iPad. And, you know, that all comes from that second lesson. Now, the third point he makes is truly poignant because he has been sick now since, I guess, 2004. And he, he basically points out that in 2004, he was diagnosed with cancer. And he says this, which is really, like, really kind of shocking in, in a way. He says, I had a scan at 7.30 in the morning, and it clearly showed a tumor in my pancreas. I don't even know what a pan I didn't even know what a pancreas was. The doctors told me this was almost certainly a type of cancer that is incurable and that I should expect to live no longer than three to six months. My doctor advised me to go home and get my fares in order, which is a doctor's code, which is doctor's code for prepare to die. It means to try to tell your kids everything you thought you you have the, you you've you've ha you you've you'd have the next ten years to tell them in just a few months. It means to make sure everything is buttoned up so that it will be as easy as possible for your family. It means to say your goodbyes. So, um, I mean, this is amazing because uh, he said this in 2005, and now we're in 2011. So, back in 2004, he he was essentially told he had three months to live. Now, here's what he says that I think is truly amazing because a lot of people get these you know prognoses that are basically saying you're going to die very soon because you have cancer, and they become paralyzed. They become afraid to continue to live. They get depressed. They don't create. They mope because they're so obsessed, like anybody would be, with the thought of dying. But this is what he, Steve Jobs said to Stanford. He said, this was the closest I've been to facing death, and I hope it's the closest I get for a few more decades. Having lived through it, I can now say this, this to you with a bit more certainty than when death was a useful but pretty intellectual concept. No one wants to die. Even people who want to go to heaven don't want to die to get there. And yet death is the destination we all share. No one has ever escaped it, and that is as it should be. Because death is very likely the single best invention of life. It is life's change agent. It clears out the old to make way for the new. Right now the new is you, but someday not too long from now you will gradually become the old and be cleared away. Sorry to be so dramatic, but it's quite true. He then goes on to say, Your time is limited, so don't waste it. 
living someone else's life. Don't be trapped by dogma, which is living with the results of other people's thinking. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. And most important, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. They somehow already know what you truly want to become. Everything else is secondary. So this is pretty amazing. Um, I mean, think about it. Steve Jobs was diagnosed in 2004 with a life terminating illness and he was told he had three months to live he had treatment he ultimately had a liver transplant. he's been fighting this cancer but the but the truth is he's been fighting this cancer for now almost seven years and those seven years arguably have been the most productive that steve jobs has ever had he's grown in that period when he was diagnosed with 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 cancer in 2004 the ipod was just starting to make Ma you know it's massive market share but it really took off after 2004 and then in 2007 he introduced the iPhone and then in 2010 he introduced the iPad so and, and you know it's just it's amazing but he basically says very important things and I think this is what has informed him in terms of being a leader in terms of taking chances, in, t in terms of, of making Apple what it is. And I think that's going to be the challenge for Tim Cook of Apple, who's the net current CEO. Um, you know, he, Tim Cook probably is inheriting a roadmap and game, game plan for Apple for the next five years. So Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs' strategic thinking has probably already been there and placed in place for the next five years but the real challenge for apple is not going to be in the next five years the real challenge for apple is going to be in years five six to ten or ten to fifteen and that's where apple might run into trouble because steve jobs brings these this life experience that is very hard to emulate because you know if you think about it Apple Apple makes big bets, and um, you know, let me talk about that. I mean, one of the things that makes Apple so successful as a company in terms of making profits and succeeding is that Apple is actually willing to make big bets. Um, it, Apple, and maybe this is where Tim Cook is really essential to. Steve Jobs' game plan because Steve Tim Cook is famous for the, being the person who makes sure that Apple's production and supply chain is put well in place before it launches a blockbuster device like the iPad. Like for, take for example the iPad. Obviously, you have you know very important hardware in there, such as the screen, such as the flash memory, such as the processors. And if it's a hit, Apple really needs to produce a lot to reach demand. But it also, Apple does these deals where it pays like $5 billion and will lock up uh, important supplies for a, a coming product that its competitors don't know about. And by doing that, by creating a new space and by locking up the supply for that space or, or guaranteeing a low price for creating a new, you know, supply for that new space apple sort of prevents competitors for just copying them and building that device now take for example the ipad if somebody let's say you had somebody who could make a really pretty ipad competitor something unique but something that used similar components well where are you going to go to get large-scale production at a price that, that you can then compete with with the ipad because the iPad 2 starts at $499. Look at HP. It tried to do it, but it came out with the touchpad at $499, but a touchpad version that was looking like the older version of the iPad. Well, who's going to buy the older version of the iPad plus one that doesn't have the ecosystem? So this all takes big bets. Apple, you know, you have a leader like Steve Jobs who believes in the vision of a product. He doesn't do market testing. He doesn't go out and survey people and say, hey, would you like this product? He, he has a, a small group of people test it, but he has the aesthetic sense to know what is something cool, what is something beautiful. 
because he has good taste. Steve Jobs has. Now, the real hope here is that Tim Cook will have, you know, the similar eye for good taste to basically say no, to basically say no, send that back. You have to redesign that. That is not up to our standards. It's almost like an artist shop, you know, like some famous artist like Michelangelo. You know, Michelangelo might have artisans working for him, and he's saying, no, that piece of art isn't good enough. So here it's art and technology blended together, and that's what Steve Jobs has brought to Apple, and that's what Apple's so good at. You know, look at the Apple stores. They don't have, they're not cluttered with lots and lots of gadgets. There's lots of room. Everything is spaced out. It's a totally unique experience walking into an Apple store. You feel, you feel like, you feel that the store is respecting you as a customer when you walk into an Apple store. You don't, like you go into a, a Best Buy or, I don't know, the old Circuit City, and, you know, there's all this junk and tacky advertising and cheap advertising, and the technology is presented to you in a sort of ugly way that makes you feel cheap about yourself, you know, and you go into an Apple store and you feel that this is almost like in an art gallery, right? It has the aesthetic of a Soho or Chelsea, New York art gallery. Everything is in white and in glass and clean and um, aesthetically simple. And you feel, wow, you know, this space really celebrates the beauty and the importance of these products. And Imagine how much Apple gambled under Steve Jobs. Apple created the Apple stores at a time when computer stores were failing. Remember there was the, um, oh, what was it? Not CompuServe or CompUSA. Those went out of business. Gateway had all these like gateway computer stores that had like, you know, cow, cow hides on computer boxes. They all went out of business. And here was Steve Jobs said, you know, let's have Apple retail stores, but let's make them stunning. Let's make them beautiful. And what is telling now, if you think about it, is that the first Apple store in Manhattan, in New York City, was right in the heart of the, the Soho Art Gallery District. It was right on Prince Street, right, be, I think, between Green Street and Worcester Street. And... I mean, why, why did, think about how incredible that is, right? Steve Jobs has a computer company and he's going to create a c computer retail store. There were no computer retail stores in Soho when the first Apple store opened. It was the, you know, there were old galleries and sleek high-end, high-end stores. And here he comes with a retail computer store in Soho, you know, and then the other stores, where are they now? One's in the heart of the meatpacking district. One is, you know, the second one was on Fifth Avenue, the iconic cube near FAO Schwartz, you know, in luxury, luxury mile on Fifth Avenue. And so Steve Jobs is willing to take chances. But what he takes chances are on people, respecting people, respecting our taste, respecting that we want, we want something of quality. We don't want just junk. And we're willing to pay a little more for quality and let the other people fight it out for the little low margin crumbs of devices that are fighting to be um, generic and where there's no profit. He wants to create something of value, something beautiful and give us a little bit of beauty with our technology. And so the software is beautiful. The hardware be is beautiful. Everything, and you know, Gu Gruber at Daring Fireball really, you know, hit it in that paragraph that I read. Everything that Apple does is beautiful. I'm sure even working at Apple, how everything is sort of designed and how it runs, it's run probably very efficiently, very beautifully. Yes, it's, you know, probably control freak area, but I'm sure everything is beautiful there. Everything is well organized. Um, just like the new building that they're building that looks like a spaceship is beautifully reorganized. So, you know, 
I think Apple is in great hands, even if Steve Jobs is not the CEO. Uh, and, you know, let's just hope he can continue acting as chairman and continue being an employee of Apple. Okay, thanks for listening to this special Steve Jobs episode of the Apple Podcast. I will cover other Apple things next week. Remember, this is a chit-chat-free uh, podcast and all Apple things. And um, see you next week, and thanks for listening. And again, this is Lex at MaxFuture.com. Take care. This has been a Max Future Production.